Welcome to today's talk. My name is Joseph Jackerman, and today I'll be discussing my absolute favorite topic, which is autonomous road vehicles, and I'll be introducing a specific definition, a specific type of autonomous road vehicle, which we'll be seeing soon on our roads, and I'll be discussing some of the human-facing considerations, things that change with this new type of road vehicle. So let's see where we're coming from, where we started. Mid 20th century, divisions of autonomous driving, divisions of clever cars that would help us and make our journeys easier, were typically tendentially something like what's shown in this image here, which is from an, a newspaper advertisement for the early 60s. At the time, the paradigm or division was largely that of roadways with lots of electronics in them, electrical cables, sensors, different pieces of equipment, and these electronics in the roadway would help to guide the vehicle such that you could drive onto the roadway, let your car or your lorry engage with the roadway, and from that point on, most of the journey would be handled by this interaction between the roadway and the vehicle, and you could just re-engage with it when you come off the large road and, and find a place to stop and park. So, as you can see in the image, the vision was one of the motorways or the roadways will provide your car the guidance, and this will allow you to use your time in different ways and not be stuck behind the wheel driving for hours and hours. And the image shows a family enjoying themselves on holiday. So this was a typical standard characteristic mid-20th century image of what autonomy might look like in the future. Late 20th century, early 21st century science fiction has given us lots of images of uh, vehicles, road vehicles that drive themselves and do various things on their own to some extent. Here is just a little sample of some uh, science fiction vehicles from a few famous comics and movies. Hopefully you'll have seen these already and you'll be familiar with most of them. But the concept here, the subtle difference that we can notice is most of these vehicles, if not all of them, certainly were independent of the roadway network. So whatever specialist capabilities they were providing and whatever protagonism or antagonism they were providing within the realm of the science fiction story, these characteristics were, were largely the result of onboard electronics and computers and things that helped the machine to think to some extent and to make decisions and to do it on its own. So we're not really talking anymore about vehicles which engage with a roadway which shepherds them along and keeps an eye on them. This is very much about the machines being somewhat independent, like an animal, like a cat, a dog, a parakeet. They can think to some degree for themselves and they can do things, a subset of things, a small number of things on their own. So. Science fiction helped us move forward from the mid-century vision, and we're really looking at machines whose computational abilities and its sensors and its algorithms are sufficient to do a basic job, to do certain things for the owner. And where are we today? We're in a world where we're getting close very close to realizing many of those science fiction predictions. We now have pretty good roadmaps for many cities. We, we have a large array of sensors such as LIDAR and visual and other uh, optic and thermal and other uh, cameras on the vehicles. And, and the onboard computational power is sufficient to drive in certain not too complex environments in a safe and reliable manner. So we're getting to the point that without the assistance of roadway infrastructure specific to tell the car what to do or to shepherd it forward, the vehicles to some degree in certain circumstances can somewhat take care of themselves. And of course, today we still have human backups from control centers and so forth to keep an eye because it's still early days and there's still things occurring on the road which we hadn't necessarily considered or designed for. But we're getting there. So what is it I want to talk about today and introduce today? What's the objective of this talk? What I'd like to talk about is a type of autonomous road vehicle we'll be seeing fairly soon, which I refer to as the friendly neighborhood robot. 
By friendly neighborhood robot, I mean the definition which is on this slide, a road vehicle which can transport people or goods. So I'm not talking about an agricultural tractor or an aircraft or something like that. We're talking about road vehicles, typically with people, maybe with goods going to shops and so forth. And the vehicle now has enough onboard automation to take care of itself and drive under relatively complex and relatively normal road situations, traffic situations, environmental situations such as rain, sleet, and snow for extended periods of time. So many of today's robotaxis might need human intervention every hour or two when some odd thing occurs to it and the vehicle sort of gets itself stuck and needs a little nudge to, to decide how to move forward. When we get past that and the vehicle is truly independent, does have sufficient agency to take care of itself most of the time. That's what I would refer to as a friendly neighborhood robot. So why am I talking about this particular development and why are we discussing it today? Well, they're going to be very complex, very expensive, very sophisticated propositions. They will require vast amounts of onboard electronics and computer processing and sensors. They will require far more than today's robotaxis. Thus, they'll be very expensive, very difficult to maintain. And as a business proposition, they'll need careful, human-centric, well-thought-through business models to get the sums to add up. So whereas many road vehicles today, human-driven road vehicles, are relatively inexpensive in real terms because most of the complex decision-making and activity is handled by the driver, so it's the owner who does most of the work when a, vi a, a current automobile or lorry goes somewhere, in the future, the vehicle must be sophisticated and complex enough to deal with the normal things that happen most of the time. And that will require a lot of electronics, a lot of cost, and a lot of care in developing the service provision and the business model that the machine is fulfilling. Now, what I'd like to discuss in the, today's talk and, and focus on is some of the human-centered, human-facing characteristics and considerations which change when we go from designing human-driven road vehicles to friendly neighborhood robots. So what kinds of things, right from the concept development stage, right from the very first steps of the design process, what kinds of things will we be talking about differently with different terminologies and different criteria and different considerations from what we traditionally would have done in the automotive industry for human-driven vehicles? Well, the first thing is the role, the impact, and the extent of the anthropomorphism of the friendly neighborhood robot. So we know from research studies over almost a century now of, of academic and professional research, we know that the body shape of a given robot affects whether we think of it as a female or a male. Gendering occurs very naturally just from looking at robots and machines. Movement from the machine is a very strong stimulator of the natural innate human tendency to anthropomorphize. So human beings know a lot about themselves, a lot about living in human society. When they're dealing with machines, which do things which remind them of people, their first reaction is usually to talk back or to act or to react in a manner that would have been the right way or the best way to do it if it had been a human being doing that action. So the innate human tendency to anthropomorphize and then think and decide and act appropriately as if it was a human that had done the movement or had chosen that, uh, that particular course of action. This is something natural, which if we don't want it to occur, we actually usually have to make an effort not to automatically react in this manner. Human names will stimulate very strongly the human anthropomorphizing tendency. If we call the robot X35, or we call the robot Betty, 
people will be more forgiving, more generous, more helpful to the robot if it's called Betty, even though it's the same robot in the same place with the same people, because we naturally tend to take courses of actions based on the associations and the connotations and the memories and things that are associated with that given name. And if it's a human name, very likely to stimulate human-like interactions with the machine and human-like speech more strongly than anything else we can do as designers if we have the navigator talk to the driver if we have the siri or the cortana talking to the user of the computer if we have our automation our chatbot or whatever it is speaking in human natural language with human realistic sounds we will automatically stimulate a very strong anthropomorphic response and people will naturally expect to interact with the chatbot in a manner not dissimilar to what they probably would have been interacting if they'd been talking to an actual human. So anthropomorphism is a very important human characteristic, very innate. It's partially hardwired in the cortex. It's also something we learn. It's not just nature, it's also nurture, something we learn through the course of life from dealing with people and living creatures. Uh, it's something which uh, is a tendency. People tend to react in certain ways, and we will be stimulating quite often those ways with choices we make for the design of the friendly neighborhood robot. And a big decision we will definitely have to make at the beginning of the design process in the concept development stage is do we wish people to view the machine in an anthropomorphized human-like manner? Do we wish to have people attempting to talk and negotiate and chat up our chatbot or our automation? Or do we wish to design the automation in a manner which emphasizes its simple, mechanical, routine, rote, repetitive behaviors. Deciding whether our friendly neighborhood robot should be more of, appear more of a simple mechanical tool that does only a couple things and does it simply and repeatedly and, and doesn't really have scope for more, or whether we want people to assume that the service provision provided by the friendly neighborhood robot is more extensive and involves more functions and more modalities and more possibilities. That's a design choice we'll have to make early on in the process because the shape, the color, the sound, the motion, the functions, everything we decide during the design process, every step of the way will be affecting this natural human reaction to the machine. Another thing we will have to think about very carefully as designers as early as possible in the design process is the name. There is historical evidence for a general law of name development. Usually when people introduce something, a new technology, a new lifestyle, for the very first time, they name it in a manner that helps people to be introduced to it helps people to understand what it might be or how it might work, understand maybe the service it provides. So the early days in most technological innovations, the words used for the names will be evocative. They will help us to stimulate memories and thoughts in the right direction to try to, to teach the people and introduce the people to the technology. So if we look at things like uh, trains and locomotives, if we look at the history of British locomotives in particular, we will see the very first ones had names such as the Rocket of Stevenson. And Rocket uh, brings to mind uh, a propellant, it brings to mind a fire, a motion resulting from the fire, brings to mind a rapidity of speed as it travels across the countryside. So the early names are trying to help us to understand how the thing works and what it does. But then we see with the locomotives, some years later, locomotives are starting to have names more evocative of the service it provides, such as the Flying Scotsman. Later on, we see what happens with later naming, according to the general law of name development. Later namings tend to be more commemorative and opportunistic in nature. So whereas at the beginning we try to help people understand things, once the people have understood to some extent what it is, how it works, they become familiar, the thing has become routine, part of our society, then we start to use names which attract people's attention, which 
commemorate certain events or people or locations. We start to use uh, names which are better for attracting attention, supporting the branding, and supporting the advertisement and the public communication of the artifact and its service. So early on, there's a lot of teaching involved in the naming. Later on, the naming is very much about trying to attract attention from amongst a crowded field. Now, there's a question as to whether the friendly neighborhood robots will follow this pattern. In the 21st century, with the internet, with social media, with all the tools we have today, is it still beneficial to use early names for the service or the product in the early days to help the average citizen, the customer, the new user to become more familiar with what it is that we've produced with this amazing machine. Whether the role of um, early naming of a, of a critical feature or a, a distinctive feature nature, whether that's still as beneficial as it once was, it is yet to be seen. We, we will see that as it pans out in the coming years. However, regardless of whether we wish to emphasize its function or not, Definitely, we cannot avoid dealing with the human anthropomorphizing tendency. So if we wish the machine to be viewed as something very simple, repetitive, mechanical, with very few options, very few modalities, and, and hopefully relatively safe because it's not doing too many things, if we want the machine to be viewed as a machine, the friendly neighborhood robot probably would benefit from having words such as box, connector, cube, mover, pod, shuttle, transporter, things like that of a mechanical, familiar, uh, routine nature. If words like that were part of the formal name of the friendly neighborhood robot or of the service it provides, it probably would help people to minimize a little bit the human anthropomorphizing tendency. It may not be that helpful in instructing what it does, or it might in the case of words like pod, but not necessarily it's going to be a great teaching tool, but it will certainly help to reduce the expectation that the thing will talk to us and interact with us and chat with us and understand our problems and so forth, as might occur with a strong degree of anthropomorphizing. Instead, if the machine is a healthcare friendly neighborhood robot that takes people to clinic for tests or takes people to hospitals and emergencies, if the system, the friendly neighborhood robot is some sort of an investment vehicle that as we're traveling to our meetings, we're working on our investment portfolio in the city, if the agency and the functions and the tools provided by the friendly neighborhood robot are varied, extensive and sophisticated, well, then perhaps a degree of anthropomorphism might help because we will uh, use the name to emphasize the fact that the vehicle does a lot more than simply transport people from A to B. And in cases like that, words like agent, assistant, doctor, guide, entertainer, specialist, or valet might be appropriate depending on the type of friendly neighborhood vehicle and the service being provided. And these names, which are typically associated with human beings. They come from human services that humans tended to provide. These, um, these words may help to uh, anthropomorphize more and to raise expectations about the variation, the degree, the extent of the services that the friendly neighborhood robot might provide. So just the name might help to distinguish and clarify a bit and, and make things a little bit easier to become familiar with and learn and get used to. Another area, a human-facing issue and another human-centered design issue where the friendly neighborhood robots will be probably substantially different from traditional human-driven road vehicles is that of meaning. Uh, the three macro gross generalizations, the three macro categories of meaning, function, doing things, executing typically some mechanical, physical activity, achieving some physical goal, ritual, uh, the artifact, the machine we're designing is helping us to, to, to go to our dinner engagement at the, at the restaurant. It's something uh, used as part of a funeral procession. It's something used uh, to, to go to hospital. There's certain rituals, certain activities that we will perform in the company of other people, either friends, family, or specialists such as doctors. There's certain ritualistic activities where the machine might be inserted there and it's a facilitator 
it's an icebreaker. It's something that makes possible a better interaction between the humans. It's, it's a connector between the humans. So there are ritualistic applications and ritualistic meanings that, that, that are important for many people. And then there's uh, value-based or myth uh, meanings, which are something could have value just by its existence because of what it implies about some abstract value or abstract concept which it refers to, which it illuminates, which it illustrates, a work of art, a painting on our wall, can't really be said to have a simple mechanical function, but it does have a value-based or mythical meaning for the people because it's the thoughts it stimulates, it's the thinking it facilitates, it's the feelings it might generate within the person as opposed to outside the person, which is the source of meaning for that particular person. Now, in this spectrum, from the very practical, functional, physical, typically, uh, side to the within the person thinking, emotions, thoughts, and value side, there's a spectrum, and it's very, very likely that the friendly neighborhood robots will be in different positions from the typical road vehicles, human-driven, we have today. If we look at the spectrum from the utilitarian, the functional, all the way to the hedonic or the meaning or myth-based, uh, we can see that these future friendly neighborhood robots might occupy different positions. And this is a design decision we'll have to make early on design process. Their exact positioning on the spectrum is likely, even if it's in the neighborhood, it's likely to be different somewhat different from those of current human-driven road vehicles, and certainly clarifying where we want our friendly neighborhood robot to be. We as designers, when we set out in the concept stage, where we'd like, what we'd like to achieve at the end of our design process, we need to be clear and agree whether we're more to one side of the spectrum or the other or in the dead center. So placing it on the spectrum of typical human needs. Everybody is different. Everybody will have different values. Everybody have different requirements. But if we take gross averages, the certain meanings that are shared amongst many people and certain machines and vehicles and road vehicles in specific will occupy neighborhoods of that spectrum. Which neighborhood do we want the friendly neighborhood robot to be in? That's an important early decision design process. Now, another human facing characteristic which will change to some extent or be used differently is that a metaphor metaphor is when we take something simple or familiar and we use as a guide for the interpretation or the design if we're designers of something more complex and more sophisticated so we take guidance by transferring over certain characteristics from the thing people do understand fairly well to the new thing that we're proposing, the new opportunity, which may not yet be as familiar to people. Now, in this specific area of human-centered design, the metaphor, the target metaphor for our friendly neighborhood vehicle, uh, there's no doubt they'll be different. There's, there's absolutely no doubt they'll be different. Over the last 110, 120 years, uh, very much in the 20th century mainly, uh, road vehicles have developed into certain types and certain categories and certain metaphors have emerged. The taxi, the business car, the family car, the rental car. The certain, you know, with buses and lorries, we have school buses, we have vans, we have certain types of goods, delivery vehicles. There's certain metaphors that have emerged from simplification, optimization, and regulation, traffic regulation and motorization regulation. And we've come to be familiar with that. Now, they've very much crystallized and taken shape over this lengthy period of time, more than a century. However, however, if we remove the driver and we remove the seat of the driver and the steering and the pedals and the secondary controls and the radio and everything else, if we suddenly have the great freedom to design the interior of our vehicle without the packaging constraints of the driver and the driver's position and all the equipment that goes with it, we end up with a very different vehicle, a very different platform. And very quickly, we end up with very different human interactions, very different human motions and human behaviors within the vehicle. So very quickly, we're going to see that these new freedoms, space freedoms, accessibility freedoms to get in and out, and, and functional freedoms that the onboard automation might 
permit us to provide certain services for the passengers, we will find that these new freedoms lead very quickly to new metaphors. There's much talk at the moment about the mobile office. There's much talk at the moment about mobile entertainment centers, somewhat like a 1980s video arcade or a small private club for special evenings out. There's a specialist shuttles, a medical shuttles, shuttles for elderly or disabled people with specialist equipment of a mobility nature. So there's lots of new ideas forming, in large part due to the freedom, the additional freedom of the space and the lack of constraints on the vehicle interior. And these are very quickly leading to different types of vehicles or different metaphors. So the metaphors are very much changing very quickly, uh, probably much more so than even the meanings of the vehicles. And uh, another area of human-centered or human-facing issues, uh, interactions. When we interact with any form of automation, particularly when we're interacting with a machine as sophisticated as the friendly neighborhood robot, we can have different types of interactions, instructing the machine, conversing, chatting with the machine, manipulating some component of the machine into position to tell the machine that we want it to do something, exploring a map, exploring a calendar, exploring some information source, responding to questions. The robotaxi has to ask us what destination we want to go to, for example, or at least accept it from a cell phone or some other device that we've inputted to. So these types of interactions are necessary with any complex form of, of uh, automation, particularly for something as independent with as much agency doing as much decision making as a friendly neighborhood robot. And the interactions, these various types, if we just look at the types we just listed and consider what we've been doing with human-driven vehicles and what might happen, possibly happen in the future with the friendly neighborhood robots, we, we can quickly conclude that they're very likely to be very different. If we think of driving a traditional automobile or a traditional lorry, we had steering wheel, we had pedals, we had gear shifters, heater box controls, radio controls, navigator controls, lots of mechanical linkages to turn and push, lots of buttons and sliders and, and touchscreen items to select, a lot of physical interaction because we had to try to make it as simple as possible, but as direct, immediate, and unequivocal as possible, given the safety considerations associated with driving a vehicle on a road, in possibly in busy traffic. Now, with the future friendly neighborhood robots, if the onboard systems have a, a degree of computational power and memory and sensors and sophistication of algorithms to be able to drive themselves and handle themselves, it's, it's, it's very likely that as designers, we will take advantage of these abilities to design also innovative, somewhat complex forms of interaction with the passengers, with other road users, and with people such as pedestrians at, at zebra crossings. So as the sketch suggests over here, what's stopping us from projecting images or using holograms or speaking through loudspeakers and talking with the people on the street or the other road users. There'll be all kinds of visual and acoustic or combined interactions which can be put in there because we're no longer relying on the human driver to make that decision, to signal it with their turn signals and to back it up with where they're looking uh, at the street to, to confirm to the other road users that their attention is directed towards them and they saw that you were coming in the other direction. If the human is out of that loop and those backups and those uh, extra modalities provided by the human sitting on that seat in the front are no longer there, we will need fairly sophisticated, possibly multiple with a, with a certain number of backups, we will need these systems to communicate with other road users and uh, with pedestrians uh, in a safe, reliable, and effective manner. And these will be different from what we were doing when we were sat in the seat of the car doing the driving.
And another final uh, topic worth noting uh, in relation to the friendly neighborhood robots, these future machines will very much raise ethical questions and require new ethical criteria and new ethical guidelines. Uh, if we delegate a large amount of decision making to the automation, that means the automation is, is thinking about things and deciding things in our place, on our behalf, in a responsible, possibly legally responsible manner. Such a sophistication raises lots of questions of an ethical nature. Uh, for example, in the automotive industry, we have some very comprehensive and very sophisticated standards in relation to physical matters, such as crash worthiness, ride comfort, thermal comfort, and other physical behaviors and physical characteristics of the road wheel. Now, those are not likely to change or not change too much because the friendly neighborhood the friendly neighborhood robots are still road vehicles they still have wheels they still drive on roads they still have a physical body they still uh, follow the laws of physics newton's laws inertias and so forth so much of what we've learned over more than a century of automotive design can be carried over to the physics of the new platforms to some degree maybe with some minor tweaking however however all that on board processing and all that delegation means that when we're dealing with issues of information, issues of navigation, or issues of behavior, uh, we're entering new territory, and we won't have precedence or not, not sufficient precedence from the world of human-driven road vehicles. We will need new criteria and new standards which are specific to the friendly neighborhood robots, because the things they will be doing as part of their interactions are things that machines, the cars and trucks and lorries hadn't been doing for the last century. So if we consider some of the possibilities and some of the issues that are likely to crop up, there's been quite a bit of recent work looking at the kind of ethical concerns which are likely to emerge with things like friendly neighborhood robots. And here's one uh, fairly recent list of uh, issues or questions that design teams would want to go through and give some thought to as they make various design choices for the, for their friendly neighborhood robot ethics human dignity the design process how the process is performed whether it's embedding and characterizing in human terms all along the way legal considerations and social considerations if we look at the exact statements on this slide it's obvious many of them could not have been an issue, could not have occurred with a human-driven road vehicle. The human-driven road vehicle, most of the complexity, most of the sophistication, most of uh, the human ethical concerns were about the driver. It was the driver who was doing this. The, the reasonable cost, the reasonable price of many of today's uh, automobiles and trucks is largely because the complexities are performed by the driver, not by the vehicle. The cost is the cost put on the shoulders of the driver. But if we remove the driver and the automation's doing it, and the automation's dealing with the information, it's dealing with the interactions, and it's exhibiting certain behaviors, we now have to design for that. It's not the human who's responsible, who's performing that. So that raises a series of questions. Many of the statements on this list would not have made any sense whatsoever for a 20th century automobile or lorry, but they're very relevant and they're very obviously of interest, if not necessity, with the in the design of a friendly neighborhood robot. So just to summarize, uh, just introducing a sampler or a, a flavor of the kinds of human-facing or human-centered design issues we're, we're facing in a few years' time with the friendly neighborhood robots. Uh, we have issues of anthropomorphism, naming, meaning, metaphor, interactions, the design of these interactions, and quite a few extra or different ethical concerns. And as you can see from the list at the top of the slide, there's choices to be made. Do we want the anthropomorphism to be minimized? Because the nature of the machine is 
such that we'd like people to always, if possible, think about it as a simple mechanical tool? Or do, or do we want to incentivize people to engage more deeply, interact more deeply and more extensively? Because the machine is providing quite a wide range of services and is the services are rather sophisticated and detailed in nature. Uh, the name, do we want to emphasize or minimize the human anthropomorphizing tendency. If we want to minimize it, we'll give it a very mechanical machine-like name. If we want to emphasize a more human name, meaning, where are we on the spectrum? Metaphor, which of these new categories? And if there isn't a category, what could be the category? What could be the new metaphor? Can we think, imagine, visualize, sketch it out? And can we be consistent with that if that's what we've identified as design target for the machine? Interactions, are they more traditional automotive? Are they going to be the full-blown, fully interactive, friendly neighborhood robot? Or is it somewhere in between? And ethical concerns. Uh, do we wish to deal with mainly the traditional automotive concerns because the machine will not be performing a wide range or a wide spectrum of services? Or is the machine of a type that, that uh, will be doing so many different things in so many different ways that the friendly neighborhood robot really has to be treated almost as if it was a human being? And we have extensive ethical concerns about how it talks, how it expresses itself, how much agency it takes for itself, how it deals with errors, how it comes back from failures, and how it deals with the, all the other elements of the service provision uh, back at base on the internet and so forth, uh, how it deals, how it fits within the ecosystem of the service being provided. So that's just a little sampler of some of the most obvious and, uh, and most immediate human facing issues that come to mind. There's, there's many more. We could have discussed quite a few more, but I, I limited it just to a few of the, the bigger uh, problems for headaches for designers in the coming years. So I thank you for your time and attention. I hope that uh, some of the points raised today uh, are, were of some interest to you. We've just tried to give a very short introduction to some of the key issues. We didn't delve into the technical substrate of the machines. We're not talking about the engineering. We're not talking about the computer science. We're assuming that technological innovations will reach the point that the, that the friendly neighborhood robots are possible and capable. And here we're just focusing and highlighting on what it means to design the friendly neighborhood robots for people, to live with people in our society. So thank you very much. And I look forward to speaking with you again on the next occasion. Thank you.